spend peripheral vision time in your garden. I really recommend that. And you know, scouting is important. But I find diseases sometimes that I don't find when I'm looking for them, when I'm just out there like soaking my garden in. You know? And I'm just completely open. And the corner of my eye catches something. And I look, and lo and behold, there's the first wave flight or something. So scout in a, in a, in a really orderly way. You know, see both ways. See with focus. And see like you are. And you're just coming into place. You know? But if you can't ID it, we already talked about it. Get it to extension. And I say here, if you take it to extension, pretend you're transplanting that plant. Take some soil, get it in a pot, keep it as healthy as you can. Get as much of the root mass as you can, or absence of root mass as you may have, as you can get, because they need everything to give an ID. Okay? If you bring them a leaf that looks terrible, they might not be able to tell. Because all of the leaf looks terrible for us because the vascular system is infected with bacterial wilt and it can't get any nutrients. You know? Really what they need to be able to do is cut the stem open and see that you know, it doesn't have a healthy vascular system. You know? So bring the whole plant in for ID. You know? And let them know that you care enough, this is important enough to you that you will pay if they need to ship it to Raleigh and get an answer. Because they can ship it to Raleigh and get an answer. Uh, if you don't get a good answer, you know, you can try another agent and see if they're better at it. You know? um, I think they're giving a, a way better effort to help an organic garden. And usually, I mean, on disease, they're usually good because, you know, what they're not good so much, I was telling you what to do about it. And there might be better agents that way, county by county, but the diseases, they affect all of us. You know, so the conventional growers, they get those diseases too. Cerium on basil. They may have the cerium on basil. It's a big deal. I mean, it's so big a deal that Johnny sells new fur which is resistant to fusarium. And yet, when I talk to organic growers, it's not a problem. But do you ever have an occasional eggplant just wilt out, I mean, basil just wilt out on you? Yeah. That's fusarium. Oh, and if you were a conventional grower, it was a whole crop. Is it with the brown spots on it? It gets brown, and then it kind of looks down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's fusarium, but it's kind of sporadic, right? You pull yeah. the one out, and that doesn't spread. Right. Always pull the one out, try not to spread the soil. But see, and I've had, actually, Frank Rose challenge me on that. He said, no, they're just soils that are resistant. But how come it's all organic so have organic growers that have soils that are resistant? How come wherever I grow basil, I get the same effect? It comes in on the seed. So you can't not get it. You know, I mean, you can buy, you know, seed that's resistant, and you can buy seed that's been um, tested for. But that's not a guarantee. That's just they're claiming the average is there, right? They grow a certain amount of seed. If it doesn't show up, they say, this isn't likely to happen. That doesn't mean that... They, they just weren't unlucky and didn't get some of the infected seed. You know? So it's kind of inevitable you're going to get it, but it doesn't seem to spread their hand. You know? And I think that's what happened with the eggplant, too. You know? And it may well have been a fusarium instead of very soil. It's one of those two, and I'll have to go back and look it up and take it for sure. Um, but if you get wilt on eggplant, it's that wilt, you know? most likely. I mean, you know. I say that, and of course, I'm sure a you know, professional pathologist and extension person would just be rolling their eyes. Because, of course, there's plenty of possibilities, but how many times out of ten in our area it's that one? I mean, that's what I'm saying. You know, it's most likely. I think my problem one that is flea beetles. Flea beetles, that's off topic, but I tell everybody <coughs> at plant, the solution to flea beetles is two prong. Grow bigger plants, bigger, healthier plants, so when they go out, they do better. Yeah. I like to step them up to three inch pots. Then they outgrow the flea beetles, you know. But also, if you spray them with surround, yeah. that cable like clay, yeah. if you get that on there good, the flea beetles don't like to be on it, and leave them alone. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. So that's it for flea beetles. There is an ag agent, a woman, who is extremely knowledgeable. She gives workshops with the Carolina Farm Stewardship. Oh, Debbie Roots. I guess she has websites. Yeah, yeah Debbie Roots, yeah. She's not in around here, but you definitely want to go to Growing Small Farms and sign up to the listserv because she is a huge resource and she's, yeah. If she was here, she would get, you know, she's the best extension agent in the state, I think, for organic growers, you know. I mean, this, well, that's, I shouldn't say this, that's um, Richard, I forget his last name, up there, Richard Boylan up in uh, Erie County, too. He's excellent, too, you know, excellent. You know, he's an organic grower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we don't have, we've yet to get one of them here. That's, that I know of, and I hope I'm not forgetting somebody. I don't think we have somebody that's that deeply committed to organic care. You know? um, I think Debbie's actually supposed to be an organic agent. You know? 
and see how the comic got an organic agent, you know? And what, we, what you can do, by the way, is you can go to your county commissioners and say, because they have a say in, in extension agent selection, and say you want, right? There's also a board, an advisory board for extension agents. You might even be able to get on it. Say you want to have an organic agent in Western North Carolina. Request this to who? Um, either by the youth bank. I'm virtually certain, I may be misremembering, but I'm pretty sure I learned that the, the county commissioners have a say. But also, there's an advisory board to each extension office. You know, which it's not impossible to get on, by the way. You know, if you you know make a case that you're a, a good represent, rep, representative of, it, of the population that's being served, you can possibly get on that board. But you can certainly go and talk to them. And try to influence who you get. And I do not want to put down any of the agents that are out there. They're all working their butts off. They tend to be really good, but they don't necessarily have the focus that they're looking for. They tend to try really hard anymore, though. So I, I only have praise for them. I have no complaints about them. And it's a process. You know, when I first got here, my first extension agent, he tried, he didn't have a clue. He did not have a clue. This was in the mid 80s, he couldn't tell me a thing. You know, he didn't have any books he could look it up in, he had no resources. By the time he retired, he was starting to have a clue, you know. And now they're all they're way farther along than that. You know? That's the main thing about ID to get ID yourself. We're gonna look here and then we'll go out on the farm when we get done with the talk and see what else we can see. Uh, but the last thing I want to say is remember that there are genetic things that look like disease, right? A classic is some tomatoes cut their leaves. You ever see that? They freak you out, but they just kind of do a little curl, you know. It's genetic, it's not a problem. You know, they just do it. You know? um, there was a farmer who called Tom Butzler, a really good extension agent in Buffalo County. He's now moved on. But he was a pathologist. He went out to the farm with growing zucchini for the first time. The guy was freaking out to get this disease all over his leaves, right? Tom went out and looked at it. It's a classic gray, mar gray silver markings that are all over his zucchini leaves. You know how they have those real pretty gray silver kind of markings? That's, that was a disease. You know? Tom's like, genetic, don't worry about it. You know? and we gave a workshop where Tom gave that example, right? And then we go out to look at stuff, and I put my foot right in my mouth big time, because we were looking at looking for diseases. It was early, grower school, right? And I said, oh, there might be something over there in the mosh. And John, John Rollins from our farm said, Pat, no, that's that mosh that has the curl, the curl, the cup leaves on purpose so the drinks salad dressing catches in it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I can play with that. You know? <laughs> so, you know, you can usually see something that leaves a disease when actually it's genetically on purpose. So you got to know your plants, you know, don't go freaking out, you know. Another thing that uh, you want to know is, you know, there are certain nutritional deficiencies that you might think are a disease. Our uh, uh, tomatoes, right, when they are grown like they grow, the lower leaves, they stop putting the energy in They get opportunistic, disease, opportunistic diseases. It's good to get them out of there, because one of those opportunistic diseases can be early fighting. But... It's not necessarily a disease you have to freak out about. You just take the leaves off, make sure they get composted, and you're okay. Unless you see it starting to multiply, unless you see it moving from this opportunistic, you know, taking care of getting the stuff broken down and moving it along, keeping the nutrition cycle going, right? If it's not if it's that, you're fine. But if it looks like it's spreading, then you got to worry about it. So don't always, you know, if you're, when you're ID disease, you have to learn when it's a problem and when it's something other than a disease or just old leaves. You know, old leaves are always going to be more prone to disease because the energy is not in them. Pruning tomatoes makes me nervous sometimes. You're creating a wound in that plant. Yeah, but the thing is, the diseases about the tomatoes that we have yeah. are not wound vectored. You know, and if they were wound vectored, that means they need a vector to get it there, which is an aphid or something like that. You know? Okay. So the wound is not much of a problem, I don't think. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, Question answer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The weather is different. You know, there, there are we, we have we have some nasty viruses that are definitely you know wound born, but they're wound born by you know an infected aphid that you know like AIDS is stuck its yeah. you know proboscis into like a beetle, you know, like an aphid, and then it went to somebody else. You know, and that's how they get moved around. You know, so I think you're okay on that. You know, yeah. and I mean a word about fruit and tomatoes. I never keep up with them. But the better you can keep a prune that's more sun 
and more earth circulation to the best bunch of size you have. So pruning is, is a worthwhile thing to do. It's just hard to do it when you have several hundred tomatoes. I mean, it gets done by the pros, you know. You take all disease matter and compost it. Composting is, yeah. I, I don't know of a disease that I won't compost, but I do hot composting. The standard for PFRP, to get rid of pathogens for humans, is if it's in a windrow or a bin kind of system where you're turning it, with the whole pile on the outside is not getting as hot, 15 days, turn it five times. So if you turn it five times, everything will have had that over 132 for enough time. No, in 15 days, you have to turn it five times a day. But you can create a vessel, right, which can simply be a closed bin, right, and still have active um, aeration or passive aeration so that there was good airflow through it. You could probably get the whole pile to heat up, and you wouldn't have to turn it maybe once or something. And that just means that they looked at how many microbes survive and precious few survive, you know. At that, at that much time. You know, they tested the parts of the million. You know, when I turned compost with a compost turner and done it professionally, I sent tests off and got back less than three parts of a million. I go, what does that mean? They said, that means you gotta have some pathogens that we can't find. You know? So you can compost well enough. If you're not gonna compost well enough, then what you want to do is have a good worm box, right? We go look at a good worm box, right? Get it, get the disease material into the box well down into the box, right? And only harvest the castings. Because there isn't a disease or a seed that will survive a worm's gut. What they feed on is microbes. So that disease is food to them. And they have this little tiny crop and tiny little bits of grit, and they grind everything up. So when it comes out their butt, it's disease free. Now, the cerium, I think, is a disease that got spread by some of these cell worm castings a whole lot of organic growers. I think of, no, actually it might have been, of course, yet, the top of capsici, which is the um, terrible one you don't get rid of, right? Why it got spread, I guarantee you, was that the person selling the worm castings was doing it mechanically and shook it a little longer and got some of the bedding out. Because the bedding has not gotten to the worm's gut, right? The worm compost went below the castings and it can have pathogens. But if you just have a worm box where you take care of pathogens, only takes castings, which you'll recognize is perfectly fine and even, right? You'll, ne you'll never get the seeds from it. That'll take care of it. You can just landfill, landfill it. If you don't think you have a way to be sure you're not moving the disease, but don't waste all your organic material. Learn which diseases are most obligate and which ones are dead the minute, you know, the most obligate ones, right, are dead the minute the plant is dead. Years ago, I was trying to turn my peas under. They were covered up with powdery milk. I called my local pathologist, Dr. Robbie, I was out in Berkeley, and he said, no problem. You kill those peas, no lose them. You know, it's most obligate. It means a live host to survive. Likewise, the lake life. That's why, you know, until it blows up in the tropics or little blows in Walmart, bring it in, we don't see it unless we have infected potatoes. Because there's no solanaceous plant that lives outdoors that can overwinter. When they had that bad infection, Vector was saying not to compost the um, white, white stalks. Yeah, it's a huge waste. They call it organic material. You can't make this, right? Their, their theory was that your pile would get warm enough to keep the plant alive, reroot, and start growing. They acknowledge that if it died in the compost pile, there was no danger of infection. I think that theory is major panic from an area that never had lake water. I've never seen any tomato plant survive my compost pile, no matter how well or poorly I compost it through one of our winters. You know? And they're in Maine, I think they would just do it over here. I think even a cold compost pile would take care of lake blight, even when you over the winter. You know? And you can tell for sure, no live plant, no disease. You, know? you might simply cut tomato vines that were blighted and let them sit until they were utterly loaded and absolutely dead. What about time and over the benefits of the top water part of the thing? You do the whole thing but wait for the year. Yeah, probably for most things, I doubt it for top for the top years. Now, the, the host obvious ones, yes, the soil pouring ones, the cinnamome, yeah. and the capsici. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, they last for years and years and years and years. Yeah. But you probably don't have them. They just don't get them, you know? That's the that's that's the that's no beer or no it works great for most things, but if you have most kind of diseases, then you got to take other steps, yes. Those no, they don't survive the heat. No, they won't survive the heat. Yeah. The heat will take them out. There are some viruses that would survive the heat. You know, we don't have much problem. With, with, what viral diseases do I know we have? Around? You can get it on squash sometimes. You ever see the spotting on squash? They get green spotting kind of. That's a viral disease. Um, I'm going to speak to when I talk about vectors. Um, yellow asters or aster yellows, aster yellows, and that is a Similar, it's not quite a virus, it's more primitive than virus, but it functions like a virus. You know? um, and there are a few diseases like that. They're, they're about vector control. If you don't control the vector, you cannot control them. You know, the vector is usually some kind of plant sucking insect. So, but you can also control it by not having brought in the typhoid berry that the vector gets it from and moves it around. 